All right, we're finally at a point where we can discuss how to derive thermal transport properties in gases um, using the tools that we have. So we've got this um, model of scattering of hard uh, spheres. So we can calculate the distance that a particle will travel before it scatters. We know how quickly particles move. And from statistical thermodynamics, we know exactly how much, er uh, how much energy they carry. Um, and so um, what we need to do now is just do some accounting of, well, if I have adjacent layers that have a different temperature, what is the net heat flux that happens between those layers? Um, so that's what I'm gonna do now. Um, I'm gonna essentially go through a derivation of heat flux um, that will recover Fourier's law and not just recover Fourier's law, but it'll tell us how the thermal conductivity is related to microscopic properties like the mass of the molecule, the temperature of the molecule, the pressure, um, the size of the molecule, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so here's how I'm gonna do it. Um, there are lots of ways to do this and I'm gonna do this um, in a more sophisticated way when we do this later for Boltzmann transport theory. But for now I'm gonna use a crude approach where um, I've got three, I'm gonna highlight three different layers um, that are meant to be layers that are supposed to be at different temperatures. Um, so I'll call the central layer Z, just arbitrarily, that is some position Z um, that you know all of the molecules in that plane are meant to have a particular temperature and then all of the molecules in the plane above it are meant to have a, let's say, a, I don't know, a higher temperature and the ones below it are meant to have a lower temperature. Um, and so the question is, what is the net heat flux um, through a little element of area that I'm highlighting in um, plane Z? Okay, so um, what do I know? So I would like to, okay, so I'm gonna highlight a hypothetical molecule or you know, statistical set of molecules coming from a position in the lower plane. Um, and what I know is that in order for this thing to have a different temperature, it has to be at least one mean free path away from the patch that it's gonna go through, right? Because there has to have been a collision in order to establish a different um, velocity distribution of particles, which is essentially what defines the temperature. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna place these layers such that the particle arriving is a distance L away, where L is the mean free path. Um, because the particle doesn't necessarily have to be directly under the patch, um, it's not a perpendicular line at this point, it's just some vector connecting where the particle comes from to the patch that I'm interested in. And I can highlight a, um, I can highlight an angle phi that defines the perpendicular portion of that. So if I take L sine phi, uh, L cosine phi, or sorry, L sine phi, L sine phi, is that right? No, hold on a second. Let me redefine that to make sure that I'm doing this consistently. Let me define this angle as phi so that it's more like and and this is meant to be like a perpendicular line now um, so that basically defines a polar a, a spherical polar angle um, between a perpendicular and everything else so in other words um, LZ is defined as um, L times cosine phi okay wonderful um, Okay, so that's, that defines the distance between planes. That's sort of the smallest distance I could possibly put the planes apart. And what I'll do is um, I will try to characterize the heat flux going through um, that little patch of planes. So I'm talking about this little patch right here. Um, so what does that depend on, right? So it depends on, um, well, what's the energy of that particle that'll be coming um, from that little highlighted point down here. So what is the energy of that thing? Um, I'm gonna call that, um, I'll call the internal energy density U. Um, so it's going to travel up with speed, let's say VZ, and uh, so it's gonna travel with energy 
u evaluated at z minus lz, so if I'm talking about this bottom, energy carried by this bottom point. So this is meant to be the energy density, the internal energy density. And that, I'm gonna, what I mean by that is it's got um, energy density in a volumetric sense, so joules per meter cubed. So this is the amount of energy density that is contained essentially by particles being emitted from plane Z minus LZ. So that defines how much energy they have, and then this piece just defines how rapidly they arrive. Um, so, and that VZ is, is the projected um, velocity, right? So that's the velocity in the Z direction um, of typical particles arriving from that point. And of course, whatever the energy density is, from this plane, only half of the energy density will be end up going towards that interface. So I'll include a factor of half here. Um, and let me check the units of this. So this is meters per second. So the energy arriving from the lower plane from this point is whatever the energy density was. So that's in joules per meter cubed. Um, times the rate at which it gets there, and if I check those units, it does. It gives me joules per meter square per second. That's the energy arriving from particles on the bottom. What about the energy arriving from up here? Well, that would um, create a negative heat flux because that energy, if it's arriving from the top, then the energy would be going in the wrong direction. Um, so I have to subtract a factor of half times u z plus lz and that gives me the energy you know coming through in the other direction from the top side um, okay so if i look at oops i did not mean to be highlighting how did i do that um, so let me erase this so i have some room to write here so and of course the energy density so this energy density the internal energy density is absolutely related to the temperature, right? So, um, in fact, uh, we I think we showed that the energy of a the um, yeah the at one point during the the uh, statistical thermodynamics chapter we should have shown that the energy density um, or uh, this thing U. at least for a monatomic gas, was 3 halves kBT, that's the energy per molecule, times the number density of molecules. So specifically, this is what I mean about the internal energy density. All right, so we'll come back to that in a second. Okay, so now if I look at what this thing is, um, now the energy density actually depends on, you know, the temperature, but also the this speed, the average speed of something coming up will depend on the temperature as well. And the mean free path depends, well, LZ depends on where the particle came from. So I can kind of see that um, this isn't exactly rigorously correct yet. What we need to really do is take a directional average. Um, so depending on where this particle came from, it might have a different, um, you know, it, it might have a different V's, uh, it might have a different velocity and it might have a, or VZ anyway, and it might have a different um, LZ. And so we'll have to do a directional average at some point, but let me just, before I do that, let me do a uh, one other thing, which is, I'm looking, at, I'm looking at this and I see that I have something that looks like, you know, a function evaluated at L minus LZ and another function evaluated at Z minus LZ, and I mean, it seems to me that what we should do here is think about a, doing a Taylor expansion, right? I'm interested in um, relating the heat flux to um, what's going on at a point in the central plane. That's really what Fourier's law relates to. And I have terms that look like, you know, a number, you know, minus a small number and a number plus a small number. That's like sort of begging us to do a Taylor expansion. Um, so let's do that. So if we do a little Taylor expansioning here, the first term, so um, this term, 
expands to give us um, u evaluated at z minus uh, lz d u d z evaluated at z um, minus u z minus l z d u d z. So if I if I take a look at it, what I'll see is that I've got like two terms that cancel each other and two terms that are additive. And so if I put it all together, um, I get. And by the way, the two terms that are additive will cancel the factor of half. And so that'll give you v z l z d u d z. Well, that's looking a little bit like Fourier's law, but not quite. I was really interested in, um, well, a couple things. So I've already, I've already sort of indicated that we probably need to do a directional average over all the possible places that this particle could have come from. But the other thing is we need to relate the internal energy to temperature. Um, let's do the first, let's, let's do the directional average first. That's easier. Um, so VZLZ I can write as V times L times cosine squared phi and um, then I can do the direction so I need to do two averages I need to do the average over the probability that this thing came over from all possible different angles but I also need to do a directional average over all the possible velocities that could have been coming up from the uh, from the bottom plane so if I do those directional averages Um, well, I'll get an average velocity, average, um, well, I don't really have to average the mean free path. It's already sort of pre-averaged. And um, then I need to, to take, okay, so I'll, keep, I'll just keep the du, dz there. But then I need to do this directional average of, um, cosine squared. Uh, in spherical coordinates. Um, if I do that, what I'll, what I'll get is that um, this top piece is going to give you something that looks like two-thirds uh, times pi. And the bottom piece will give you something that looks like um, two pi. And so the, the net result is that you get a factor of one-third out of all that. Um, and so the final answer, which I guess I'll write over here somewhere, is that you know this thing is one-third times the average velocity um, times L. Uh, the mean free path times du dz. Okay, how does u, how does u depend on um, temperature? Um, I need to think about this a little bit carefully because it says partial derivative here. It's really supposed to be in the z direction only, um, and u depends on is a state function essentially, right? So like u or internal energy always sort of depends on, um, or it's a function of the temperature, the volume, and the number of particles, right? Um, but, you know, if I'm trying to, if I'm only considering the fact that temperature can change between layers um, and, you know, my state function looks like this, then what I mean by, you know, taking the derivative with respect to temperature is to take the partial derivative at fixed volume and um, number of particles, um, in which case um, what you'll see is that basically this thing is one-third um, times du dt at constant volume and number of particles times V L times DT DZ. And this thing is nothing but the heat capacity or especially because, so note that I had written the internal energy density up, up here um, volumetrically. So this was supposed to be in joules per meter cubed and that means that when I come down here and I need to do 
um, this derivative, what I really mean is that this is the volumetric heat capacity at constant volume. So in other words, this thing is uh, CV, and it's written on a volumetric basis. And one thing that I was a little bit lazy about was the minus sign. So you'll notice that up here there was a minus sign that came along with the LZs that I forgot to carry along. So let me just patch that in here, 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 here. Um, and so now what I have, if I just compare these two things, oops, not that one. So let's compare this to this, and voila, uh, we see that basically, um, you know, by doing a basic accounting of the heat flux, um, what we have is something that relates the heat flux to the local temperature gradient, and there's a constant of proportionality that sits in between, and uh, so we can identify what that is, right? So that thing must be the thermal conductivity, and the value of the thermal conductivity is apparently that the thermal conductivity is one third CV L, where L is the mean free path. And so that's really pretty much all there is to it. So you can do this. Uh, so the so we've identified that the thermal conductivity is one third CV L um, from our you know, from what we know about the Poisson dis or sorry, the Maxwell distribution for velocities, we can figure out what the average velocity is in terms of the mass and the temperature. Um, we can figure out the mean free path in terms of the um, number density of gases and the size of the particles. We can figure out the heat capacity in terms of, let's see, what does heat capacity depend on? That only depends on the number density of uh, particles, basically and so for a monatomic gas and so we can figure out what cv and l are from all of the previous things that we've learned and i'll do that in the next slide and calculate the thermal conductivity based on microscopic principles um, so how awesome is that um, that's there's a lot of so you can do this for pretty much like this kind of technique for every type of transport property. I'll show you how to do it for viscosity and for molecular diffusivity, um, but the bottom line is that like you can you can follow this kind of approach to get almost any microscopic property. Um, later I'll show you an even better way to do this. So um, there are I, there are some small it's hard to hard to talk about yet, but there are some small discrepancies in the way that we did this, and some more accurate results. But um, but this will get you 99% of the way there with about five minutes of work, um, and and it's a lot easier to to do this kind of approach. So actually, if you go into old physics textbooks, you'll see this kind of like these kind of formulas um, presented as fact um, in old physics textbooks. So the the fact that the thermal conductivity is one third CVL is a very famous formula. Um, okay, so let me do a couple of things now. So let me wrap up by uh, turning the one-third CVL into some actual, you know, uh, properties of materials and see how the thermal conductivity depends on number density and mass and temperature and pressure. Okay, so um, let's do that and then I'll show you how to do this for a couple of other um, properties.